So our Archaeology Cafe series, as I've emphasized in the past, is really about bringing to you uh, people who know very special places across the Southwest and their places that you, uh, after about 7.15 tonight, could head out and visit. So um, it's, uh, it's places that I think you'll be excited by uh, what people have to say about it, the photos you see, the stories that there are to tell about these places. The focus tonight is on Grand Staircase Escalante, and I think everyone here is probably aware that that was one of the first landscape scale national monuments uh, in 1996. Uh, President Clinton declared it as a, about a 1.8 million acre national monument in southern Utah. And <clears throat> near the end of his uh, first year in office, President Trump cut it in half and downsized it. So it's one of the things that <laughs> agreed <laughs> very much. Krista agrees as well. So <laughs> we're all on the same page, I think. Um, but that is one of the things that Archaeology Southwest has joined uh, one of the lawsuits to uh, restore that other half of Grand Staircase Escalante. So Krista Sadler is going to venture into deeper time than we normally as archeologists explore. So she has a very diverse um, uh, <coughs> resume of things from uh, being a river guide in the Grand Canyon to uh, lecturing, forming nonprofits. Uh, she's a very creative and uh, I think very good communicator uh, about things geological and she's going to take us to Grand Staircase Escalante and look at some of that deep past uh, there. And remember, it's a place that you can visit. Uh, so Krista, I'll let you take it from here. Bill, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for being here uh, on this lovely, warm... Uh, I heard somebody complaining about the cold, and I said, oh, you two Sonans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Flagstaff. This feels lovely. <laughs> so I appreciate your coming out, um, and I appreciate your coming out to, to um, talk about a place that is known very much for its archaeology, but what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to go a little further back in time, as Bill mentioned, and um, talk about the paleontological record of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. I'm only going to focus on one particular part of that record. It's actually a very extensive record. And if you want to know a little bit more about it, there is a, uh, this is the Shameless Commerce Division. There is a book for sale out there that talks about the sort of the, the broader view of the paleontology in the monument. But I also want to tie this into um, what we can learn for, possibly learn for ourselves and for our future. So uh, let's see if I can do what I'm supposed to do here. Okay, there we go. As, as Bill mentioned, I do a lot of different things. I was trained as a paleontologist at UC Berkeley and when I came up to Flagstaff to work for the Museum of Northern Arizona, I did some of my first work in, in this region in the place that would be established as Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. That was back in the late 80s, and it wasn't until 1996 that this became a monument. Um, this is one of the most extraordinary places in the world, not just scientifically or educationally, Scenically, it is absolutely extraordinary. So I want to walk you through some of the aspects of this, of this monument. As Bill mentioned, uh, the monument was established on September 18th, 1996. I was actually at this point, right here on the South Rim. It was the first monument that was established to be run by the Bureau of Land Management, not by the National Park Service. And again, as Bill mentioned, a landscape scale. 1.7 million acres was the original monument, and it was set aside to help protect uh, the, the biological, geological, paleontological, historical, archaeological um, resources in the monument 
as well as the ability to do the research and teach about them. So it was really set aside uh, for scientific and educational resources, but also as a multiple use monument. So um, you can still hunt, you can still fish, you can still take your ORV in certain places, your off-road vehicle. Um, even small scale, like wood cutting, things like that, grazing is still allowed on the monument because it's managed by the BLM and not the National Park Service. So it was really um, an experiment. At the time, I wondered why he was on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and not up in southern Utah. <laughs> and uh, then we found out that uh, he was being hung in effigy in southern Utah. So that's why uh, <laughs> this was a very controversial monument from the start. But after 20 years, after you know, 20, 22 years, we, we thought it was safe. Now, I want to take you a little bit to sort of the where and the when of all this. Um, for those of you in Tucson who have not spent too much time in the north, uh, to the north of you, this uh, boundary here is what is known, this defines what's known as the Colorado Plateau. So it sort of centers on the Colorado River drainage. Uh, you guys are way down here. Here's Flagstaff. And then here's Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Now, this is the old monument. This, a, a lot of the pictures I'm showing you are of the original boundaries. But you can see that uh, it's, it's right up next to a lot of other uh, public lands, national parks, things like that. If you zoom in on the uh, monument itself, uh, here's the weird boundaries <laughs> of the monument, sort of coming down like this. Um, it butts right up against Vermilion Cliffs National Monument down here against uh, Capitol Reef National Park and uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. So, and then uh, Bryce Canyon here and a lot of national forests. So it is that 1.7, the original 1.7 million acres, which later was, was ratified by Congress to 1.9 million acres, is part of an even larger uh, landscape, sort of patchwork landscape of protected uh, in various you know, in various levels of protection. but um, And that's something that we'll get to later, but it's really important, I think, to understand that. Um, it was not designated to protect just one single place or a particular archaeological site or a particular thing. Um, it, was, it was designed to protect the landscape. It is part of, or, or let's put it this way, uh, what we call the, the Grand Staircase, the geographical feature that we know as the Grand Staircase is part of the monument. And the Grand Staircase, here is um, the Grand Canyon. This is a cross section of the earth, so the sort of layer cake cut down into the earth. And you can see if you go north from the Grand Canyon, there's a series of cliffs that go back like bleachers to the north. Um, and these, this is what's known as the Grand Staircase. The chocolate cliffs are down here. These are the Vermilion Cliffs, the White Cliffs, where Zion National Park is, uh, and Capitol Reef, that's all that rock layer. Uh, the Gray Cliffs is one that has a lot of the Grand Staircase rock layers in it, and then the Pink Cliffs, which is up at um, Bryce, Bryce Canyon National Park, that's the Claron Formation. So this wonderful, um, bleacher sort of you know, this, this feature that moves back with um, layers eroding back away from the edge of the Grand Canyon and then these harder cliff forming layers in between sort of moving back. And this is what was named the Grand Staircase. That's where uh, the monument got its name. Now I will say, if you go to the monument to visit and you're in the town of Escalante or Boulder or Tropic and you say, Hi, where's Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument? They are going to know you're a tourist. Because the way you got to pronounce it is Escalante. <laughs> they, there's a lot of other pronunciations, but it's basically Escalante or Sclanty or Sclant. Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> so these are some of the classic landscapes of the monument. And this is the kind of landscape that most people are going to see when they go to the monument. Uh, very famous around the towns of Boulder and um, Escalante, Utah, with this beautiful, beautiful um, white and pink Navajo sandstone, just gorgeous. This is the Escalante River drainage, and this is Calf Creek here. 
beautiful. You can go out and just see these incredible uh, landforms. This is, I don't know if I really like the name of this. It's called um, the Cosmic Ashtray or the Cosmic Navel. I don't know about that, but a lot of you know arches and these amazing potholes and things like that. Um, these incredible cliffs. Just want to show you some of the different landscapes of the monument. There's also parts of the monument that are far less well known. And that's the area that I do most of my work in. Um, this is a part of the monument that's very hard to get to unless you have a really good four-wheel drive vehicle and you know how to use it. Places that aren't necessarily on the tourist map. Maybe they're a little more subtle than those beautiful cliffs that just smack you in the face. But these places are equally a part of the monument. They are as important and they have an amazing fossil record in them as well. Um, this is sort of at the southern end of the monument, looking out towards uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, out that way. And then this is very near Escalante, but most people only stop on the edge and kind of look in. So the monument is very well known in some places and very poorly known in others in terms of uh, tourism. So we'll just talk a little more about that. So as Bill mentioned, uh, we are going a little further back than archaeology. Um, the, the time period that we work in, or that I'm going to talk about in, for this presentation, is right here. OK, so we've got the Mesozoic right here. This is the age of dinosaurs. And you can see it's just this little, little tiny sliver of Earth history. There's all of this stuff that comes before that. This is where we start seeing sort of the kind of life that we think of as, as familiar life, you know, trilobites and sponges and all kinds of stuff. And all of this 87% of Earth history either has very simple life or no life at all. Then we get up into the Mesozoic. Right here, the age of dinosaur. Here's the Cenozoic, the age of mammals. And the, the stuff that you guys work in is that tough black line. <laughs> so, I do a great uh, exercise with the kids uh, when we're talking about geologic time. I have one of them put their hands out like this. And with a marker, we mark across their body. It's usually a, it's usually a boy, but I try and encourage the girls to do it. Um, and we mark different events in our history. And somewhere right around here is where you know multicellular life appears and we work on through. And then I give them a fingernail file and I say, okay, swipe your face. Okay, you just wiped out all of human history. <laughs> so too, when I was in archaeology, we called all of the stuff I work in now underburden. And now we call all of the archaeological stuff overburden. Um, so now you can break down the Mesozoic here into three time periods. You've got the Triassic, the Jurassic, which everybody knows. Thank you, Hollywood. Uh, for that, <laughs> and then the Cretaceous. And this is the time period that we are really concerned about in Grand Staircase, although there are fossils from all the way back here as well. But not only just the Cretaceous, but we're only working in this part of the upper Cretaceous. <laughs> so the record at Grand Staircase is um, from about the, the stuff that I write about and that I work in is from about 100 million years to about 75 million years. So really only about 25 million years, which I know to an archaeologist sounds incredibly long, but to somebody who works in the Grand Canyon, it's like, eh, you know, it's a little snap of the fingers. So just to kind of give you a little perspective on the timing of all of this. Um, now, there are rocks of late Cretaceous age throughout Arizona and Utah, all of these dark blue smudges are places where you find rocks of late Cretaceous age. But they're not all in the same time period. Again, the late Cretaceous lasted a long time. It lasted 30 million years. So the, the stuff that we're looking at down here in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument is a slightly older than a lot of this other stuff. So it's very special in that regard. And I just wanted to show you, you all should recognize this. This is our stratigraphic column of the layers, um, the late Cretaceous layers in Grand Staircase, going from the uh, Naturita Formation here, which is also known as the Dakota, and then up to right about here, 
So it's a huge stack of layers and all of it has fossils and all of it has an amazing fossil record that's really, really important. So then the other thing we have to talk about is what was going on in the world at that time? Because the land, the whole world looked really, really, really different. If you go over here to start with, off of the west coast of North America, a big plate of the Earth's crust was being pushed down and subducted underneath the rest of North America. And as that was happening, what it was doing was raising up a mountain range all along the western part of North America. But it was also kind of dragging the middle of the continent down. And as it sort of dragged the middle of the continent down, the ocean was able to invade from the north and from the south until it literally split the continent into two thirds. Over here we have what's known as Laramidia, and you can see it's this long skinny continent with um, this mountain range running like a spine up, of it, up it. And then this is Appalachia over here. And in the middle was the Western Interior Seaway, from this, this very shallow ocean, maybe not more than about a thousand feet deep in the very middle of it. And it kind of uh, expanded and contracted over time, but I wanted to sort of give you this sense. Now, the other thing you have to realize is that Utah was, sorry, get, get me, where are we? <laughs> um, so here's New Mexico, here's Arizona, here's Utah, up here. Um, Utah was at about 46 degrees north latitude. So right now it's a little over 35, uh, Flagstaff's about 35. So it was a little bit further north uh, than it is now. And at this time, the planet was really, really different. So we had obviously much higher sea levels here. We had, it was much, much warmer. There were no permanent ice caps at the poles. There were conifers growing at the poles. They found evidence of that. Um, CO2 levels were much higher and the whole ambient temperature was basically a lot warmer than it is now. So, or than it was <laughs> a little while ago. We'll get to that. So, so just, I just wanted to set the stage for you because um, what we're learning from the fossils is really helping us um, create this, you know, sort of recreate this, this uh, environment. Okay, so why is the late Cretaceous so important to us? Well, for us as humans um, interested in our world, it's really important because it was really the beginning of our modern world. What we think of today as the stuff, the plants and animals that we have in the world today. So this is weird stuff that used to exist prior to um, sort of earlier in the Mesozoic. Um, we had, you know, the beginnings of some of the dinosaurs, but a lot of really, really weird creatures that no longer exist. We also had very strange plants that either don't exist anymore or exist in very small numbers. These are these enormous things called tree ferns. They're actually not redwoods, they look like it. Um, this is the stump of something called a cycad, which still exists, but again, in very, very small numbers. So the plants were really, really different, but by the late Cretaceous, we're starting to see the rise of flowering plants, the angiosperms, and that's, they make up over 90% of the, of the plants that we have in the earth today. And they completely changed the ecosystems. So we started getting uh, magnolias and sycamores and rose families, and we start seeing a landscape that looks a lot more familiar to us. <laughs> We also have strange archaic forms of animals that existed earlier in the Cretaceous. You might think this is a dinosaur and this is a dinosaur. They are not. This is a crocodilian. This is actually more closely related to uh, both of those, both this guy, Costasuchus, and an Aedosaur here, Typothorax. We're more closely related to crocodiles of today than they are to dinosaurs. Um, but these guys both died out. Um, this is a something that's uh, vaguely on the line to mammals, but by the late Cretaceous, we're starting to see modern forms of fish, bony fish. Um, we're starting to see modern forms of lizards like this. And then these are some of the world's first bee burrows. Um, so we're starting to see modern forms of arthropods as well. Why would the bees appear kind of right around in the late Cretaceous? Flowering plants, exactly. It's a really cool connection there. We also see uh, the first true birds 
and true mammals. So we had things on the mammal line back way back when the dinosaurs were starting, but we're really starting to see the first true mammals in the late Cretaceous, like true placental mammals. And um, so that's, so it's a really interesting time period. And then of course, in the late Cretaceous, we also have just this extraordinary diversity of dinosaurs. I promised you dinosaurs, so here we go. Um, <laughs> if you do paleontology, you realize that finding a dinosaur is actually not necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. It takes you years to excavate it. It takes you, you know, helicopters to get those things out of there. Whereas if you study mammals, you're, you're taking home buckets full of stuff and you got mammals all over the place. So, you know, everybody thinks it's great to find a dinosaur. It's not always. <laughs> um, so a lot of these guys down here are sort of the older, you know, Triassic, Jurassic, but then when we get up into the higher levels of the family tree, the more recent ones, we're starting to see all the dinosaurs that we think of, you know, the, uh, the horned dinosaurs and the duck-billed dinosaurs and the tyrannosaurs and things like that. So um, the late Cretaceous is an incredibly important time period, kind of sets up our modern world. Okay, we're back to this guy. This stratigraphic column I mentioned shows you uh, from the Naturita all the way through the Kaparowitz Formation. We are only going to talk about the Kaparowitz Formation because you guys would be here till about Friday if I started all of this. So we're just, what I will say is that everything that leads up to the Kaparowitz Formation is setting the stage and is incredibly important. And there's just an extraordinary fossil record in all of this stuff. But the Kaparowitz Formation is the thing that is making the newspapers. This is the formation that is, that is really um, helping expand our understanding of life at this time in the in the in southern Utah and in, in western North America. So the Kaparowitz formation um, is only two million years worth of time represented in that formation. And yet it's about 2,000 feet worth of sediment. It's a huge formation. And you'll see that it it tends to look, it's this very sort of dull blue gray. Um, this isn't the stuff that, that makes tourists go, oh my gosh, and I have to take a picture of it. Um, it's a lot more subtle. The Caparitz Formation and this whole region was first mapped by Clarence Dutton in uh, the 1880s. And he actually did a fabulous job. Here's the Caparitz Plateau. And all these different colors represent the different um, uh, ages of the rock layers. He actually did a great job. He got it right. Um, so, you know, back in the 1880s, he, he, uh, he actually, you know, had the layers um, well mapped and, and the right ages, and we've been fine-tuning it since then. Um, this, these are some views of the Kaparowitz Formation. Again, this sort of gray-blue, very, um, it looks like you could just sort of skate down it, but what happens is, You'll be walking down these badlands, and first your feet are sinking in. You're thinking, okay, this is working, and then all of a sudden it just becomes ball bearings and hard pack, and you just so it's it's not quite as easy as as you think. This is uh, what's known as the blues. This is a uh, Powell Point up here, the Pink Cliffs, but all of this is the Kaparowitz Formation in this region known as the Blues, and it's incredible what they've what they have found in this formation. So you can see here. This is the, the, the vertebral column, the backbone of a dumbbilled dinosaur just sticking out of the wall. Um, and then this, look at this, this was excavated a bit, but that is an enormous carapace of a turtle, a huge turtle skeleton. And this thing is just, when the monument was established, there were a few sites known in um, these layers and in the Kaparowitz Formation. There might have been a hundred sites. Now, 20... Four years later, 23 and a half years later, there are thousands of sites, and they have still only um, they have still only really looked at and prospected maybe 10 percent of the monument, 10 uh, percent of these lands. So, literally thousands of, of um, paleontological sites. So here's between 74 and a half and 76 and a half million years ago. Again, just a reminder, we were. Uh, kind of on the edge, you know, we were on the coastal plain, this region of where Grand Staircase is, was on the coastal plain, the mountains to the west, big rivers pouring off these mountains, uh, maybe something on the scale of the Ganges, just huge 
Coolidge River is pouring off and pouring out into the coastline, which was sort of in, in uh, easternmost Utah. And all of these rivers pouring across into this basin and just piling sand and gravel and mud all throughout the whole region. Okay, so we'll start with the plants. What do they tell us about the climate? So we first start, we have a lot of water-loving plants. These are things, this is actually sort of a distant relative of today's water lily, kind of. Um, and this is a, a species that lives basically in the water. So we have a lot of water-loving plants. We have palms, this beautiful um, structure there. They live a little further away from the water, but they still like moisture. We had uh, sycamores, magnolias, roses, other kinds of plants that grew a little further from the water. So you can see we're getting a full cross section now. And then you also had conifers that lived in the, you know, quote, uplands, not up in the mountains, but just up away from the water. And when they looked at these conifers, um, you know, here's a beautiful fossil, here's another one. And this is a modern allegory. Um, not allegory, I just lost the word. Anyway, uh, a modern comparison, um, what they found is that these are most closely related to things that live in Southeast Asia today. So that gives you a, a little bit of a climate sense. So we're looking at pretty warm, um, pretty humid. We have smothering vines. This is the leaf of something related to the modern moon seed vine. Um, which if you're from the south, they are everywhere. Uh, and there's a, a, a site called Moonseed Mountain with just millions of these seeds and some leaves as well. So, so what we're looking at is a landscape that was warm and humid, uh, vines maybe smothering some of these trees, and uh, some of the analogy has been maybe something like southern Louisiana, um, something like that in terms of uh, temperature and, and rainfall. The turtles that we find suggest a pretty warm and humid climate. We find, you can see this guy's hand. This is an enormous, this is only part of it. Again, we find three foot long turtle shells. And these aren't tortoises. These are actual turtles that are living in water. That size turtle really only lives today in the tropics. They like, that has to be a warm, humid, um, non-seasonal, kind of a-seasonal landscape. Um, there's a really cool little turtle we found that has a reconstruction of it, two little, little pig-faced turtle. It's really cute. And this is another one of these really big turtles, and I threw this in just to show you. You see these dark circles? That's where I circled. Those are eggs. This is a turtle with the eggs still inside of it. So that's, you know, the, the fossil, the preservation in this um, formation is extraordinary. There's an incredible diversity of lizards. Um, this, they have, uh, this is a monitor lizard today, and there's something that's related to a monitor lizard, but then a whole bunch of other kinds. Now, these look like, you know, Godzilla teeth, but these are microns. Uh, in the book, it actually has a little, uh, you know, scale bar. These are tiny, tiny teeth. This is a slightly larger tooth, but you can see there's a, like a blood groove here. So just an incredible variety of lizards to go with this incredible variety of landscapes from the water all the way out to the sort of you know, uplands. We have a bunch of different kinds of mammals, including what might be the very first sort of true actual placental mammal. That is something like us that has a placenta. Um, this is not the mammal. <laughs> that is a dinosaur skull. But I loved this picture because look at they've got these little guys. They're like bouncing all over the place. So, um, and then uh, this is the jaw of a little marsupial mammal. You can see it's about the size of a toothbrush. And then again, this looks like a Godzilla tooth, but it's very, very, very tiny. But these are these wonderful mammal teeth with the little cusps on them. You can see they, they vaguely resemble our teeth. So we're starting to see tremendous diversity in the mammals, too. Huge alligators. This um, Dinosuchus, terrible uh, crocodile. Uh, some of them got up to 25 feet long. And then uh, uh, other kinds of um, crocodilians, like uh, Brachychamsa. Also, we're starting to see modern-looking modern fish. Here's a classic bony fish here, guitar fish, gar fish, all kinds of different things that they're uh, pulling out of these uh, rivers and estuaries and things like that. And then a huge diversity of dinosaurs, especially in the horned dinosaurs. So this is three different skulls of three horned dinosaurs. Um, 
This is Utah Ceratops, which is the first horned dinosaur to be found from the monument. Um, this is uh, Nizuna Ceratops, which means big nose horn face. <laughs> and then this is Cosmoceratops, which had 15 horns. And these guys were kind of like bangs draped over its head. We're not really sure what this was for. Maybe, maybe the lady dinosaur loved it. I don't know. But um, it had, you know, these horns as well, and then cheek spikes and things like that. But then all these strange horns there. But this extraordinary diversity of horned dinosaurs within a relatively small area. So keep that in mind, we'll come back to that. So what the dinosaur bone tells us about the climate, it helps um, sort of reaffirm what the plants suggest. So I'll explain this. These are two cross sections of a, of a major, like a femur, big leg bone in um, one of these dinosaurs. This one is from Canada. These are from Cretaceous sediments in Canada up in Alberta. This one on the right is from um, Grand Staircase. Now, the difference, you notice this one almost looks like a cross section of a tree. It's got these rings. The bones of many dinosaurs show uh, seasonal growth patterns. So uh, in the summer, when things are great, they're eating a lot, things are wonderful, they grow. Then there'll be a little bit of a, um, this line, a little, uh, sort of pause in the growth when the winter comes, when the food is less available, uh, and there's a little bit more stress on them. So in dinosaur bones, and a lot of dinosaur bones in northern climates or northern regions, you see this um, type of growth pattern. Look at this one, nothing. It's completely homogenous, which suggests that Life was pretty good all year long. These guys never really had a stressed, stressed out time, which is pretty amazing. Um, so that, that supports what the plant said about it being warm and humid. Uh, okay, so we have duckbill dinosaurs, hadrosaurs. Um, this is a hadrosaur footprint right here. Um, this is a little skull of a baby version of this guy. So here's the little baby skull and here's the adult. This is a Parasaurolophus. Um, this is another Gryposaurus, another hadrosaur here. And then the other thing you get at the monument in, it's not unheard of elsewhere, but it's in extraordinary numbers, is um, skin impressions. Um, these hadrosaurs. So that is the impression of dinosaur skin, uh, at least for hadrosaurs. We don't know if the other dinosaurs had different textured skin, but these guys seem to have these little um, bumps on them, which is kind of cool. And then some other weird dinosaurs. These are uh, nodosaurs. We find them. Uh, we find this is a pachycephalosaur, which is a bone-headed, a dome-headed dinosaur. Uh, we think they the hit heads like bighorn sheep do today. And then the carnivores. There's also a tremendous variety of carnivores from little tiny things like this guy, Palus simpsoni, a uh, little guy, this little guy here is also, these guys are probably feeding at the, at the lower level of the food chain. Uh, Struthiomimus is maybe a little bit higher than that. He was a pretty swift little guy. Um, and then at the upper level of the food chain is Teratophonius, which is um, a relative, sort of a great, 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 great grand, grandfather of Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, there's nothing in the middle. There's nothing that takes up the kind of middle levels of the food chain, but we think maybe um, that uh, juvenile teratophonius were sort of in that, in that middle range. But again, a big variety of, of, of um, carnivores, you have to have a lot of prey for them to have a big variety of, of carnivores. So that suggests also, uh, we have true birds. Full on true birds, Avasaurus and other enantiorthine, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but um, type of birds. And then a whole bunch of really weird things that don't often get um, preserved elsewhere. I don't know if you can tell what this is. <laughs> it is an enormous, it's about whoa, two meters thick, layer just packed full of clams. So it's just millions of clams. And um, we think this might have been a storm surge, something that dumped from the estuaries up into the rivers. This weird feature here is an ant nest. 
This is a picture of beetle scrapings on bones, fossil bone, but beetles from the time when this animal had just died. So it's not modern beetles eating away at the fossil bone. This is what happened to take away the skin and the flesh of that animal. So the Kaparowicz has so extraordinary a record that we're getting things preserved that we don't normally get preserved. We don't see beetle scrapings on bones very many places. We don't see ant nests. You know, when you when you look at fossils, you look for hard things like teeth and bones and maybe, you know, trees if you're lucky. But we have everything from little tiny, tiny uh, things like the ant nests all the way on up to big bones and stuff like that. So what this means is that we can start trying to recreate an entire ecosystem with this formation. Now, obviously, we don't have everything, but it is, it is so complete for the fossil record that we're able to start asking and maybe even beginning to answer some very interesting questions. So this is maybe what, you know, this is the Walt Disney version, right? <laughs> they always throw everything in together, like, ah, happy animals. Here's a, here's a young Teratophonius kind of checking out the Parasaurolophus. Here's some of those turtles, the Avasaurus. Um, got a, a Brachychampsa down here and the Cosmoceratops and more birds flying around. You got a little mammal up here staying out of the way. So this really was this extraordinary menagerie. Um, this is southern Utah 75 million years ago, roughly. Um, you can see conifers back here, and then here you've got the vines crawling up the tree trunks, you've got palms, and we are looking at this extraordinary ecosystem with rivers braiding back and forth across the landscape and things being fossilized everywhere from actually in the river to on the floodplains to even a little bit further away up in those, like I said, those sort of you know upland areas away from the water. So we're getting an incredible cross-section as well as an incredible cross-section of the critters. We have the ecology and the critters. Okay, so what is the importance of the Kaparowitz Formation and Southern Utah's late Cretaceous record? So just the gee whiz thing is that this has basically set the standard uh, worldwide for this time period and these kinds of ecosystems. So the terrestrial ecosystem in the late Cretaceous, these, this spot right here is has set the world standard. Now these boxes show a few other places where late Cretaceous sediments, again, not exactly the same age. Um, we've got Montana, we've got Alberta, um, we've got over in um, New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico, and then down near Big Bend. So there are fossils from this time period in other places, but this is really the gold standard for this exact time period to help us understand how this um, you know, how Western North America evolved. So there is such, I mentioned this before, there's such incredible preservation um, of material from the Kaparowitz Formation that we actually are able to start to recreate an entire ecosystem, which is super rare um, and very, very important. There's also just an extraordinary amount of diversity in the Kaparowitz Formation. Um, as I mentioned, all the diversity of, of different dinosaurs and lizards and mammals and things like that. There's also, and this is really unusual, a really high level of what we call provincialism or basically endemic species that don't exist anywhere else in the Kaparowitz ecosystem. And that raises a really interesting question, why? There was no, as far as we know, if you go back to this picture, there were no major barriers to um, travel. You know, there's no, the mountain range went this way, but you could travel a coastal plain. You know, we don't, we don't see any, any major barriers to travel. So why don't we find the dinosaurs here up in this area as well? Um, it wasn't such a huge difference in temperature as it is now, things like that. So these are some questions that the Kaparowitz Formation can offer us and that the paleontologists are working on that might help us or give us food for thought for the future. So the one I just mentioned, why is there such a huge amount of this provincialism 
in the faunas of the Comparowitz Basin. What does that imply for us, uh, for the, the uh, distribution of plants and animals on the planet today and as the climate warms? Because we're heading for this very soon. <laughs> same level of CO2, same level of, of um, thin temperature, things like that. What is life like in a hothouse climate with higher CO2? This is one thing that the, the paleontologists are looking at. How do we, how do we understand what life is like in, in this, you know, in this, uh, as our temperature rises and as CO2 rises? Where will the greatest biodiversity be on the globe in a warmer climate? Now, this is really interesting because you remember that map where there were uh, things in Canada and then things down in uh, Big Bend? From what we can tell, the record starts to get a little, little pretty spotty as you go further south. But from what we can tell, um, the Kaparowitz region was kind of the Goldilocks, you know, just the right place. Um, you go further north, and you were probably um, limited by daylight hours and food avail availability. You go further south and it starts getting too hot for this kind of diversity that we have in the Caparolids. What, what are the implications for that for us? That was at 46 degrees latitude. So what are the implications now as our globe starts to warm, are we going to start seeing um, die-offs in the tropics, and, and what, where is that sweet spot going to be um, as you move, as you move north? Um, how do ecosystems respond to and function in a warmer climate? And again, because we have this incredible diversity and this incredible uh, preservation in the Caparowitz Formation, we, we can start asking and answering some of these questions. How is this ecosystem responding? And does evolution proceed differently in a hothouse world? And, and this might have a serious implications for food production and, and you know, all kinds of things that agriculture, things that matter you know, to us as humans, not just for um, other species on the planet, although that matters to me as well, and I imagine to you guys also. <laughs> but a lot of the paleontologists are even starting to ask questions about, will this affect agriculture? Will this affect the species that we can grow, where we can grow them, things like that. So these are some of the, these are the five big sort of takeaway questions that um, people are starting to be able to, you, know, you can't always ask and answer a lot of questions in paleontology, you know, because you're going back 75 million years, you can say, well, this lived then. <laughs> But to be able to move into the future because of what you're seeing that far in the past is, is very unusual. And that's one of the reasons Grand Staircase is so special. Okay, um, I apologize for the next slide. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Bill already mentioned this. Um, in December 4th, 2017, Donald Trump decapitated, I call it a decapitation, you'll see why, 50% of the monument. This was at the behest of the Utah politicians, the Utah delegation, uh, locals who had been pushing their politicians, and then the energy and the OHV sectors. Um, now, unfortunately, I click on this for some reason. That wants to stay on longer than it should. Um, these, the, the pale yellow indicates the old boundaries of the monument. The mustard color is the new boundaries. And when you look at this, you realize that it, it, it makes no sense. I mean, they've put this massive corridor right down the middle here. That's the hole in the rock road corridor. And that was taken out at the request of Utah, a delegation who wants to pave this road and turn this into a state park down here um, uh, as you get down towards uh, the hole in the rock area. So you have the Escalante Canyons section of the monument. You have, uh, this is the uh, uh, Kaparowitz section of the monument. And then this is the Grand Staircase section of the monument. It's three different um, sort of use areas. And you can see some big chunks taken out for things like coal. That's why, that's why this was taken out. This is where the vast majority of the coal is. But there are a lot of other, um, other uh, resources that are, are being considered here. 
Now, if you look at this, is a, this is the old monument. Um, if you look at the, the outer boundaries, this is the old monument. And I, you probably can't read this over here, so I'll just sort of um, help a little bit. The, the green are uh, known paleontological sites, and the red dots are um, known archaeological sites. Okay, there is a huge archaeological record in Grand Staircase. It goes back possibly as much as 13 or 14,000 years. So you've got, you know, basically Paleo Indian all the way up to the modern Paiute and Hopi tribes who, who claim some ancestry there. Um, and, but you can see the numbers of, of sites, just huge numbers. And now, this is the um, potential fossil yield categories. And again, this is the old monument. But uh, red is extremely high. So this is that <laughs> Kaperowitz formation that we were talking about. But there's also very high in other parts down here, the Wawi formation, other things on the, on the boundaries, um, and over here. And then you can see uh, uh, dark blue, or the sort of gray color is a four. Uh, pale blue, like this, is a medium fossil yield category. But you can see that there's really very few places where it's um, low. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about medium on up. Now, um, you take away, you look at what was taken out, and we lost over 700 known fossil sites. This is all stuff that was taken out. Um, that's not including archaeological sites. So this is stuff that is now, it's still federal land, still managed by the BLM, yeah. but it's, doesn't, it's not afforded the protection of a monument. If you compare, again, you kind of compare uh, the old monument boundaries here to the new monument boundaries, you know, here's this little dude over here, um, you can see what, what, we're, what we're missing. Um, that the stuff that's been taken out has a lot more fossils in it, has a lot more archaeological um, uh, remains in it. Uh, incredible biology, incredible ecology, historical relics, things like that. Um, if you compare, again, the archaeological and paleontological sites from the old map here, and then compare them here, look, you know, all this area down here and over here has been cut out. A bunch of sites up in here, all this stuff has been cut out. And you can just overlay these and get a sense of what has been taken away from protection, monument protection. So what can we do? <laughs> um, now is when I get a chance to climb up on my soapbox. Um, OK, first, we need to keep protesting this and all the other actions by this administration to slash these protections. Um, the rally the day before Trump made his announcement, uh, December 3rd in Salt Lake City. <coughs> and that's me uh, reading my statement. And I think at the end of it, I said something like, it took geologic time to make these places. It will take geologic time to, for them to recover from mm -hmm. the kinds of things that are you know, being planned. Um, come visit, please come visit. Um, this is, these are two places that have great, you know, some really cool fossil exhibits. The Big Water, Big Water Visitor Center has a great fossil exhibit. This is a really cool horned dinosaur exhibit that shows how their, um, their, those big frills worked. Uh, and then the Escalante Interagency Visitor Center is just a wonderful place. Sometimes they have fossils there, but it's just a great place. There's also the Canab Visitor Center, the, the um, uh, Cannonville Visitor Center. So there's a lot of places to go, but these are two places that often have fossils if you want to go see fossils. Um, uh, if all you want to do is just drive the paved roads, that's OK. It is so spectacularly beautiful. This is. Uh, going between Escalante and Boulder, this is what's called Head of the Rocks up here, and you just come down this amazing, you know, sort of snaking down this, this landscape. Um, you can drive to incredible landforms on dirt roads that aren't too bad. You can drive to incredible landforms on dirt roads that can be really bad. Um, this is the Cottonwood Road. Don't ever do this if it has just rained or rained within about two weeks. <laughs> so, but it is an extraordinary road to drive. 
Um, it's not actually high clearance. You just maybe don't want you know something that's like that. Um, I mean, you don't need four wheel drive. You need decent clearance. But you know, look at those rocks. Just this, everything is just tilted right up. Just incredible. Um, there are places you can go to see fossils out on the land that are pretty easy to get to. This is the Wolverine Petrified Forest, which is, um, I gotta see if I can find it on my, it's right over here, so mm -hmm. it's sort of over mm -hmm. in the Escalani and Boulder area, um, mm -hmm. and you can drive to this, um, and some of this was taken and the edges of this were kind of taken out of the monument, and there were people trying already trying to take um, petrified wood. Luckily, their eyes were a little bit bigger than their stomachs, and they had to leave it because it was too big. But um, this is a big problem that we're worried about. Um, now, this, you're going to say, why is she showing me a picture of something white? Um, <laughs> this is the 20 mile uh, washway dinosaur track, 20 mile wash dinosaur trackway, and it is really incredible. If you look here, and here, and here, and here, and here, you can see them wandering off into the distance. And when you get there, you can actually see the shape of the track really nicely, and there are more tracks in this whole area. So the 20 mile trackway, if you go down the hole in the, wa hole in the rock road, it's <laughs> down in here. And again, you can drive right to that. It's a very short hike to get to it. Um, it's a really, really, really cool spot. Um, you can do slightly longer hikes that take you to, this is a very easy hike. It's three miles one way to Lower Calf Creek Falls. Very popular place, just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, these places are, are as far as I'm concerned, they are miracles. Uh, to see this kind of water in the desert. Um, if you want to take a much harder hike, <laughs> you can get to the flag point. Uh, well, look, see, I drew in archaeology. <laughs> I, I, I knew I had to throw in one. But this is actually a really cool spot. So these are dinosaur tracks at a place called Flag Point. And you can see these tracks just kind of heading out towards the edge of the cliff. Obviously, the cliff was not there. Um, <laughs> these are actually Jurassic-aged um, tracks. But what's really cool, this, is, this involves a, a short drive on a dirt road and then a very, very, very hard climb. But it's, you can still get to it. But really, right next to it, or very close to it, is this amazing pictograph site. And look at this. They recorded the dinosaur tracks. And a lot of archaeologists think that this may be where something like the legend, bird, legend of the Thunderbird came from, where you, these guys knew what bird feet looked like. And then they see these that are 12 to 14 inches long. <laughs> like, Okay, that's a really big bird. So uh, it's very interesting where you you do find um, some sites around there that have that have you know a connection between the humans and the, the long ago. Um, you can get out to places that you can just go wandering. You know, park your park your car off the side of the road and go. You don't have to pay. You have to carry your water and your food and be careful, but uh, there's extraordinary places to visit out there. And when you do go out walking, you can always keep your eyes open for archaeology, for paleontology, for um, historical artifacts, um, or just beauty in general. <laughs> but whatever you do find, please let people know. If you go out there and you see people doing something that really, really, really shouldn't be done, and we are starting to see this, you can take pictures. Um, you can mark down where you were. Your picture, your phone will have the GPS coordinates in it, and you can send them to the people who are fighting for this land, uh, like Archaeology Southwest and Grand Staircase Escalante Partners. This is who... Um, I would recommend you connect with if you want more information about how to protect the monument, if you want uh, to get involved in educational experiences or citizen science uh, monitoring opportunities. It's one of the things I do. I monitor up there. Uh, they, they assign me areas to go, and I go and see what's happening. What are people doing? And I take pictures, and I send those pictures in to our legal team um, so that we can hopefully... 
Yeah, my blood pressure has been all over the place in the last few years. Um, but anyway, if you want information just about the monument, about the current status of the lawsuits, um, this is a great place to go. Uh, GSENM.org. It's pretty easy to remember. You can just sign up for their mailing list. You don't even have to join, but um, if you have a few bucks left over from Archaeology Southwest, I'd, I'd throw it to them. Or Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, Conservation Lands Foundation, Wilderness uh, Society, all of the organizations that are fighting these lawsuits uh, for Bears Ears and for Grand Staircase, um, they can use all the help they can get. And um, it is really important for us to protect these places because we're not getting any more of them. And um, once, they're, once they're destroyed, they will recover, but it will be a very long time. So um, I hope that you will get up there and go enjoy the fossils when you see them and enjoy the landscape and just get out there in that vast and extraordinary space that has so few people on it. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, So, a little bit of energy there. So there must be a couple of questions. Here's one right in the front row. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, sharing your passion, your knowledge, everything. It's, it's so important. Thank you. Questions? How do you decide what color to make the feathers on the birds? <laughs> that is an excellent question. Um, there's a little bit of guesswork there, but also um, based on modern birds and kind of, you know, how they how they show off. <laughs> so somebody must have a better question than that. Come on. Here we go. Just to get some idea of scale, um, if you were going to go down that road that you had in the upper corner, down, I don't know if it is a road or the one from Boulder. How, how, how many miles is that to, oh, to go down? Hole in the Rock Road? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Hole in the Rock Road is, and it just flew right out of my head. I think it's about 40 miles of dirt road, and it's not really high clearance. It's, um, it's washboardy and bumpy, and uh, people get in trouble when they go out there after a rain, things like that. But you can actually do it in a two-wheel drive car. It's a lovely drive. You just have to be willing to, it's a little teeth shattering at times. <laughs> uh, is Bear's Ears uh, visible on any of your maps? Uh, no, Bear's Ears is further to the north and east. Um, and it, in case you aren't aware, was, um, I call, I call uh, Grand Staircase decapitated because they really took stuff kind of all around the edges. Um, but Bears Ears was eviscerated, um, and it was about 87% of it was removed. Um, and, and they made two tiny, tiny, tiny little places that are just focused around some archaeological sites. But there are literally thousands of archaeological sites in, in Bears Ears. So. And cool fossils, too. Yeah. So was one. Oh, 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 sorry, we got uh, right over here. She's, oh, <laughs> I can repeat it for you. Once it was removed, under what jurisdiction did it go, and what uses are now uh, permitted there for the uh, public? Excellent question. So the question was, once um, these monuments were were um, eviscerated, decapitated, <laughs> um, not that you can tell how I feel about this, um, what, what jurisdiction did they are they under now, and what uses are now permitted? So the short answer is they're under the same jurisdiction. It's, it's, it was BLM land before, and it's BLM land again, or now still, but it's just lost that le level of protection, that layer of protection of being a monument. So the, what's, and this is something that um, is really important to know, the BLM just came out with their new resource management plan for both of these monuments. They, as soon as the jurisdiction, or not the jurisdiction, as soon as the, the boundaries of the monuments changed, they just leaped on doing a new resource management plan. Um, it took about four years for the first one, for the first one for Grand Staircase to happen, and this one took several months. <laughs> so, um, so 
Now what's allowed theoretically is mineral extraction, you know, coal mining, uh, uranium, <coughs> fracking, oil, gas, but also they're opening up some new areas to some areas to um, offer vehicle use that had been closed. Um, they're talking about, oh, I don't know if you remember that picture, right? Uh, the beautiful sandstone, and I pointed out the Escalante River drainage, like that beautiful green velvet ribbon just flowing down. While they're talking about allowing cows back into the Escalante River drainage, it has taken us 24 years to restore that and it is absolute paradise now. It was a place where cows could graze in the past. So um, that, those are some of the uses that are being, uh, they're allowing for casual collection of fossils, but not, not um, vertebrate fossils, basically invertebrates and um, wood, which doesn't, isn't considered a fossil, it's considered a mineral. Um, so those are some of the, the, the kinds of um, uses that they're talking about. And this, this new resource management plan is, is really scary. Um, it's, it's very terrifying if you really want to read uh, something that will make your blood boil and put you to sleep at the same time. I think it's about a 900 page thing or, or something ridiculous like that. But it is very scary. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, what sort of paleontology is going on? on the Kaparowitz now, and um, can it continue? That's a great question. So the, the vast majority of the Kaparowitz Plateau and the Kaparowitz Formation is still protected as monument. Um, and there is still paleontology going on. There are um, four or five sort of main groups that work. There, there are probably more than a dozen uh, institutions and organizations that do paleontology there. But the main ones are the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the uh, Natural History Museum of Utah up in Salt Lake, uh, the BLM out of Kanab, the Raymond Alf Museum out of California, and then there's a couple others. All of them are managed through the Kanab office uh, with a fellow named Alan Titus, who's the, the monument paleontologist. He kind of deals with all of that. So they're still doing a lot of paleontology, and that's great. Um, but we, you know, who knows how much we've lost in terms of protection. Um, now, you know, people just hiking through the desert aren't necessarily going to recognize if they found something. But if they go in and they do mineral extraction, or there are off-road vehicles allowed in an area, or they start grading roads, which they're talking about, that will. Um, destroy or seriously damage both paleontological and archaeological and historical. So if you guys are interested at all in becoming a volunteer with any of these organizations, especially Denver and the Utah Museum, they have really robust uh, volunteer programs and you can actually you'll get trained, uh, you learn all about the geology and paleontological techniques and they do archaeology as well and so you can go out and, and work with them uh, in, during their field seasons. So you can get in touch with the uh, uh, Natural History Museum of Utah or the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They, Denver has an enormous um, volunteer program. So kind of cool. <laughs> uh, are you going to be signing your books <laughs> at the end of this? He's my agent. Um, <laughs> yes, I will be outside if anybody is interested in buying the book. It, it's not archaeological, sorry. But it does go into much greater, uh, it, it's not scientific text, it's written for the general public, but it does talk about all of those layers and um, the stuff that came before. And it was written and published um, the year the monument turned 20, so none of the new politics is in there. Um, so it's kind of a happy book. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> any other questions? To Krista, uh, we're going to uh, okay. close it up. People actually want to drive off to Utah now and see this. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you so, will. It's an extraordinary so place. Another round of applause. Thank you, Krista.